<laughs> Welcome, everyone. We have a special visitor from the East Coast <laughs> who, is a, <laughs> who is a colleague of one of our professors, Jesse Fan, who's with psychiatry and uh, the, also an adjunct professor in the Department of Rehab. And uh, Jesse, whom you probably, most of you know, uh, will be introducing uh, Dr. Tessa Hart. So, Jesse, Dr. Hart. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, it's really a, a great pleasure for me to introduce close friend and colleague and collaborator uh, for many years now, and as well as with many of our other University of Washington faculty involved with traumatic brain injury research. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have her. Uh, Dr. Hart is um, a, an institution, uh, not institutionalized, but institution <laughs> scientist and uh, director of the Traumatic Brain Injury uh, Clinical Research uh, Laboratory at Moss Rehabilitation Research Institute in uh, Pennsylvania and also a research professor at Jefferson Medical College. She's a neuropsychologist but by training and uh, is really an expert in uh, treatment and outcomes research in traumatic brain injury with a focus on uh, psychological, and, uh, cognitive, and emotional um, factors uh, and functioning, as well as social and vocational aspects of uh, community integration in this population. She's also an expert in uh, treatment models based on self-regulation theory, which I'm sure we'll hear more about, and I imagine uh, comes in handy with her own faculty in this uh, research <laughs> funding climate as well. Um, I'd like to also mention that uh, Dr. Hart is a fellow of the American Congress of Rehab Medicine and also president of the American Psychological Association Division 22 in Rehab uh, Psychology. Um, I missed something there. Um, and also, <laughs> finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Hart is um, uh, an, on multiple editorial boards, uh, national uh, panels and uh, expert uh, review panels for uh, tr uh, traumatic brain injury research. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Hart. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you all so much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here, and with seeing so many friends in the audience, I'm, I'm very happy to be here talking about one of my favorite topics. Can everybody hear me? Um, just as an overview, what I'll be talking about today is I, I, I promised I would start out with just a really brief uh, run through of some of the basics of, about TBI, uh, make sure we're all on the same page, but nothing detailed. Um, then I'll talk about anger and irritability after TBI, some of the treatment approaches that have been tried, and then I'll talk mostly about our development of what, we're, what we call the anger self-management training uh, program, which is being subjected right now to a controlled treatment trial. I want to acknowledge um, uh, the funding by the uh, NIH, specifically NCMRR, and um, several people who are involved in this work. Um, Roland Mayuro is our anger expert who is here in Seattle and directs uh, uh, anger management, domestic violence, and workplace conflict programs. Um, you can see the people here who are involved from uh, right here at UW, including Jesse, uh, Dr. Joanne Brockway, who's here, Dr. Soraya Dickman, who's here, and Dr. Nancy Tempkin, as well as colleagues at Moss, and Craig Hospital, which is a clinical site in the trial and also serves as the data coordinating center. Many other people are involved. I didn't have enough room on this slide to put all the names up, but it's, it's a wonderful team effort. Well, as promised, I'm starting off with just a little bit about TBI. I'll go just very quickly through these. I, I know most of you are familiar with this. The, the CDC defines TBI as a bump, blow, or jolt to the head. That's a closed head injury or a penetrating head injury that disrupts the normal function of the brain. And the, the damage can be caused by a number of external mechanical forces. Falls are actually now the number one cause in the U.S. It had been motor vehicle crashes for a, a, a quite a long time. Um, and there, you can see all the other different ways that you can damage your brain, including uh, blast injuries, which have gotten much more attention recently because of uh, military injuries. Um, there are basically two types of mechanical forces that can damage the brain in TBI. 
One is translational forces. Those are the um, kind of back and forth or side to side motions that the, where the brain is uh, bouncing against the skull side to side. And uh, this causes bruising, uh, particularly in the anterior parts of the brain, orbitofrontal and anterior temporal. And this is because of the way um, our skulls are, are created. So the, the brain bouncing back and forth over the, these bony surfaces concentrates contusions in the anterior part of the brain, as you can see, uh, un the under surface of the temporal and frontal lobes, um, and the uh, also the lateral surfaces, but especially the orbital and medial surfaces, or orbital and ventral surfaces. The second kind of mechanical um, force you know, that causes brain injury is a rotational force, and this is where, in addition to bouncing up and uh, back and forth side to side, the brain actually twists on its uh, its axis here, and because the different parts of the brain are different uh, tissue densities, um, they were they rotate at different speeds, and this causes shearing and twisting and severing and stretching of um, axonal connections and especially axonal uh, connections that are related to arousal and uh, wakefulness, and also connections between the basal forebrain uh, here, again, prefrontal with the rest of the brain, and these so-called shearing forces can also cause hematomas uh, because blood vessels are twisted and broken. So uh, what this boils down to, and this is oversimplified, is that the translational forces can cause focal injury, again, especially in the, the frontal and anterior portions of the brain. The rotational forces uh, by severing axons and can cause what's known as diffuse axonal injury, or DII. And the diffuse axonal injury is what leads to the very characteristic either loss or alteration of consciousness that <coughs> immediately follows the traumatic brain injury. And it turns out that the depth and duration of uh, altered consciousness is the best index of injury severity, usually after TBI, because the diffuse axonal injury doesn't show up on imaging studies. The contusions will show up, the, hem the hemorrhaging will show up, but not in unless it's very severe, diffuse axonal injury is not visualizable. So uh, the best index of injury severity is behavioral. This just shows that uh, before the TBI, the person has, you know, relatively normal day-to-day -day memory, just like we all do. And at, immediately after the TBI, there's a there may or may not be a, 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 a frank loss of consciousness, which we call coma. But there's a, always, if it's significant enough, there's a period of disorientation or altered consciousness. And uh, the duration, the number of days between, or weeks or months, between the TBI and the resumption of relatively normal day-to-day -day memory and orientation is uh, the duration of post-traumatic amnesia, or PTA. And this turns out to be the best severity, index of severity of TBI of the diffuse axonal injury. <coughs> so um, that's kind of the uh, acute picture. And uh, the long-term consequences really are mostly what we're interested in here when we talk about anger and irritability. Um, and I also wanted, wanted to note that even though TBI can go anywhere from just a concussion with a brief alteration of consciousness like an athlete who gets their bell rung, um, mostly what I'm going to be talking about is a program that we apply to moderate to severe TBI, which is a TBI that's more than a concussive injury. It's more severe than concussion. And in a very general metric, we're talking about people who've lost consciousness for more than half an hour, or they have altered consciousness for more than uh, 24 hours, and, um, and they may have positive findings on uh, imaging. So we're not talking about concussive injury for the, for the remainder of the talk. Um, and in fact, most of the patients we work with in, in anger management in this program have uh, TBI that's much more severe than concussion, and, and I'll, I'll get back to that later. Anyway, these patients who have significant brain injury um, recover, but they are often left with long-standing deficits, and the deficits, because the injury is kind of a patchy injury, uh, the deficits are, are quite varied. They can have physical problems, or they may not have any physical problems at all. Uh, they often, all, very often, have cognitive, long-standing cognitive difficulties, and they have problems with emotional function. And um, these 
uh, deficits contribute to very widespread limitations well documented in return to work, school, social relationships, and quality of life. And uh, we became interested in anger and irritability because no matter what other deficits are, are present, these are very significant problems for many, many people with TBI. So we decided to try to do something about this. Um, here's a few just little factoids about why it's uh, a significant problem. It's a very frequent complaint, and all the studies differ, of course, by samples and, you know, uh, acuity and all this stuff. But across studi studies, you find this as a complaint in a quarter to a third of people who survive a significant TBI. That's really a lot of people. Um, if they had anger problems before, and of course they might have, in fact that might be how they got their TBI, many people anyway say that they get wor they're worse after the TBI. And um, they, there's a, a, a quite a wide range of symptoms uh, included in this problem of anger and irritability. We're not really talking about frank uh, aggression uh, necessarily or agitation. Um, people have different symptoms from becoming pa more passive aggressive, more sarcastic. Uh, more irritable, all the way up to you know yelling and having outbursts and acting out physically. Family members often say about these folks that they feel like they're walking on eggshells, that they can't say or do anything right, that, that they're living with a cranky person, and, and that wasn't true before. And um, they report that any kind of ch challenge or change in the routine is met with an outburst of some kind. Um, anger and irritability occurs across the spectrum of injury severity, so it's really interesting that doesn't seem to be a dose, there doesn't seem to be a big dose response relationship to injury severity. Um, and it's a, 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 it's a persistent problem. The long-term follow-up studies show that it may even get worse over time. Um, and again, as I've said, it, it's a problem that has been shown to contribute to uh, the other problems like family burden, social isolation, and vocational failure. <coughs> Take a swig of water. Let's talk about what the treatment options are for, the, for this population. Anger is actually a very difficult problem to treat in general, and it's difficult, um, especially after TBI. It's difficult partly because it's one of the symptoms that might actually exclude people from therapy programs or, or, or lead therapy programs to kind of give up on people or to lead patients to drop out of therapy programs because they get ticked off and people don't really know how to deal with it. It also, um, it, there also tends to be, with uh, people who have chronic anger and irritability, a tendency for their social supports to burn out and fade away. Um, and if you think about, you know, what happens if a person's living with uh, chronic, a per if you're living with a person who has chronic depression, you're likely to be very concerned about this and to say, you know, we've got to get you some help. Um, you're, you're really miserable and upset. If you're living with somebody who's chronically angry, it's easier to just uh, to, to give up and burn out. And so um, uh, people have less of a tendency to have social support network that is pushing them toward treatment. Um, I should mention pharmacologic treatments, and you know, uh, Jesse and others of you probably know much more about this, but I, I believe it's still true that there's really nothing that has a strong evidence base for treatment of this problem in TBI. Um, beta blockers can be helpful for severe aggression and agitation. Of course, they have side effects. Um, physicians sometimes try SSRIs case by case to see, and sometimes these can be helpful in reducing irritability. And there's a couple of um, promising uh, dopaminergic agents. There's been one study actually of methylphenidate that showed a decrease in irritability uh, years and years ago, and it hasn't really been, hasn't been followed up. And then um, Flora Hammond and colleagues have a, an ongoing RCT testing amantadine in. Um, irritability, and uh, UW is one of the sites, so that, that might show up something. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to go through some of the other treatment options that have been tried without spending a lot of time on it. There are behavior management techniques that have been applied to um, anger and aggression, and um, uh, contingency management techniques, for example, differential reinforcement of behaviors that are either incompatible with, with uh, aggression or uh, gradual reinforcement of lower rates of aggression. Um, there are some good case studies on the success of these 
techniques, but they do require a very tight control over the environment. They're not really feasible for outpatient settings. They don't generalize well to other behaviors, so you'd have to, you have to sort of pick one behavior at a time. I actually think that the, the best thing we can learn from these approaches in general is to keep them in mind for preventing aggression. And for those of you who are working on in an inpatient setting, we see this all the time, no matter how sophisticated and well-trained your staff is, it's uh, very easy to inadvertently reinforce patients for acting out by letting them out of therapy. So, um, We actually looked more at psychoeducational and psychotherapeutic approaches uh, for developing our approach to um, anger management and TBI, but I do want to say that uh, they've been tested mostly in the non-brain injured population, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, uh, just general ang anger management programs, of which there are very many. Anger management programs are all over the place. Most of them are based on this original um, model of, called stress inoculation training, uh, which was originally developed for anxiety treatment and has evolved into a more general approach and um, was, has been used for anger management. It's basically a cognitive behavioral approach. You teach the person how to identify triggers, self-statements to help relax, don't take, take things so personally. Funny, that doesn't work for me usually, but <laughs> it could work for you. Um, and relaxation for self-calming. And the current programs are, are really quite varied. They have a lot of different components that are put together in different ways. Most of them are hybrids of cognitive behavioral methods and, and SIT. And the evidence for them is very positive. Now again, this is in regular angry people, this is not in people with brain injury, but the effect si average effect sizes are uh, tend to be about 0.7, that's actually pretty good. I want to point out a couple of things that, that I learned from these meta-analyses. Individual treatments are generally more effective than group treatments for this problem, and uh, uh, these two points that I'm pointing out on this slide are, are, are things that I'm absolutely obsessed over, and this is validation of my obsession. Treatments using a manual, one of my obsessions, some of you know, have about twice the effect size of ones that don't in, in these meta-analyses. And treatments that use fidelity checks, I'm looking at Dr. Brockway because she's our fidelity checker, have three times the effect size of those that don't. I rest my case. <laughs> so the question now is, will, will this type of model work for brain injury? And um, the question is, will the advantages of CBT-ish approaches work for people who have cognitive difficulties? That is the big question. I mean, the advantages are that you're not just getting people to suppress behavior, you're teaching them new skills. They're skills that can generalize to many situations. You can help them improve their insight, and, and you're helping them to control themselves rather than to be controlled by other people. But this is the big question about CBT and, and brain injury. Now, there have been some studies, small studies, that show promise in adapting some of these methods in um, individualized training. And so, again, Dr. Brockway comes up. She and Jay Yamamoto, he, right here, did um, a w nicely controlled um, uh, AB design with two patients and families who learned individualized strategies, uh, quite effective. Uh, O'Leary did a, a, an uncontrolled study with, with five people in a group. You can see that uh, there's some evidence piling up, but it's really very s small. There's been one randomized control trial with, this stands for Acquired Brain Injury, ABI. Tiny study, but um, it was individual sessions and it was based on SIT and um, uh, showed some promising findings um, on something called uh, anger expression out. And this is a subscale of the state trait anger expression inventory, or STAXI, which is kind of the gold standard. And I'm, I'm stressing it because we we're also using this measure and we're looking actually at, this, at some of the same outcomes. And so even in this small study, there was some effect on the um, anger expression out, and that's the tendency that you, uh, to which you express your anger to other people. It's a self-report measure. Um, there was one other study that was published recently, in fact, uh, after we developed our program, this, this came out, and it was, it's a group treatment and uh, a large N, but no control, and what they did was they just collected a clinical case series over eight years, doing the group over and over, but again, um, showed improvement on the same um, uh, measure. So, 
our study group, the ASMT study group, and this is our logo, which <laughs> I stole from the internet. It's probably copyrighted, but <laughs> um, I haven't heard about it so far. Oh, I love it. Um, we wanted to develop a, a treatment that was uh, a psychoeducational treatment uh, that had these characteristics. We wanted it to be fully manualized because that's my obsession and replicable so that it would be replicable for other people. We wanted it to be administered one-on-one, -on -one, not in groups, really tailored to TBI or, or to acquired brain injury. Uh, ours is it was very heavily focused on TBI, but we could easily adapt it to acquired brain injury. We wanted it to be able to stand alone as a treatment or to be included in comprehensive rehab. We wanted it to be feasible with people who have significant cognitive impairment, which is challenging. And um, this last one is also very challenging. We wanted it to be based on theoretically motivated active ingredients, another obsession I have, because if your treatment is not based on uh, hypothesized active ingredients, you won't have any basis to um, refine it and test it if it doesn't work or if it does work. You really have to know, you have to at least have an idea of why it's working. So we had to face the question of where to begin in in, in, in developing these active ingredients and building the treatment around it. And in general, here's the problem we had. In designing a new treatment, it's, it's often helpful to uh, build your active ingredients around things that get at the, the root causes of a problem. So just to take a medication example, because those are kind of simple, um, you, can, you can think that attention problems uh, with or without TBI are caused by certain neurotransmitter deficiencies and methylphenidate boosts the levels of those neurotransmitters and therefore methylphenidate should alleviate attention problems, which in fact they do to some degree in TBI and people without TBI. But if you're dealing with a problem like anger, you've got so many potential causes of anger and all of them affect people with, all of these causes can affect people with TBI. So. You can have primary or organic causes, and it's been shown empirically that people who have frontal lesions, which are very prevalent in TBI, TBI are more likely other things being able to express anger and to over-express anger. Um, you have secondary effects from the brain injury that lead to irritability and frustration, like not being able to follow what's going on because you have attention deficits, not being able to express yourself or really understand what other people are saying, not being able to remember what's happening and thinking people are stealing your belongings that you're actually misplacing, and all of those contribute to frustration. Also, um, people with brain injury typically you know, uh, suffer lifestyle changes that are uh, quite um, frustrating, like loss of independence. You find people who are fully grown who move back in with their parents. That's um, not exactly a fun uh, situation. They've got income, uh, loss of income. They have stress. It goes on and on. Um, Premorbid factors mentioned that people may have been, have, may have had anger problems before the injury. Often those are exacerbated, but definitely those play into it. Some people have personality disorders. The thing about developing a treatment around these root causes is that one of my colleagues said to me when we were developing this treatment, um, well, why don't you, I was talking about these multiple root causes, and he said, why don't you just develop a, like a smorgasbord, and then people with this problem can get this approach, people with that problem. And the, 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 that's a nice logical idea, but in fact, you can't really measure and pinpoint the relative magnitude of these for a given patient. It, 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 we're just not there yet, and many of these different issues are all wrapped up together. So what we decided to do was to find a final common pathway to conceptualize the treatment. And, you know, we reasoned that no matter what other causes exist, and we know that there are many different causes, there appear to be these two characteristic deficits in executive function that contribute, frequently contribute to anger after TBI. And uh, just to review, I, I'm sure this term is familiar to most of you, but executive function is this kind of catch-all term that refers to cognitive and emotional control mechanisms that are um, you know, mostly subserved by these frontal regions that are very vulnerable to TBI. So executive dysfunction is really very common after TBI, and these are functions that are really critical for managing and regulating ourselves in various ways. And so um, 
so this is a contributing factor in TBI. And um, the two very characteristic deficits that are considered to be executive deficits, which are very common in TBI, one is impaired self-awareness. In other words, a failure to recognize one's own problems and their impact on other people. And some of the work in my own lab actually has shown that people with TBI are le least aware of their behavioral and emotional problems uh, than they are even their cognitive problems and definitely than their physical problems. And what this leads to is a reduced ability to actually monitor the impact of your own anger episodes, even if you realize there's a problem. I mean, these patients do realize they have a problem with anger, but they don't remember the de they can't talk about the details. And also, they tend to blame other people when things go wrong. That goes along with the impaired self-awareness. The other characteristic deficit is impaired problem solving, in which anger becomes a very stereotyped, inflexible response to any kind of threat, like a change, feeling of confusion, or any other problem. And you lose the flexibility to develop and use other responses, and you, and, and you lose the ability to inhibit these angry reactions that hurt you in the long run, that don't help you get what you want. And there's, without going into detail, there is evidence that both of these deficits are treatable. There's been self-monitoring training that has been effective in TBI. And there are now several RCTs showing that you can train people with <clears throat> TBI to improve their problem solving using kind of algorithmic approaches. So we built the manual around these two main ingredients self-awareness and self-monitoring training, and training of very specific methods for problem solving as alternatives to stereotyped anger. We um, designed eight sessions. They were they're one one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a significant other is invited to join portions of three sessions, the beginning at the middle and the end, in a very strategic way. That's not mandatory, though. As I said, some of these people have burned their bridges, and so we don't insist that they have a significant other, but it's very helpful if they do. And we use very highly structured uh, a manual and patient materials. The therapist is actually using the manual during the sessions. It's like a workbook. And this is just a random the screenshot of a random page in the manual. So I can show you, oh, it's really concrete. We actually have one font for things that the therapist can say or paraphrase, a different font for tips. Uh, we have these little icons that clue you into, this one says use a visual aid, and then you're supposed to reach for your visual aid. It's neat. It's actually very easy to use. Um, I also want to mention the core clinical concepts that are just embedded in the entire program. These are really important, and these are, these are attitudinal things that the therapist conveys all the time, even while they're going through this highly structured content. So you guys know this better than I do, but um, the first thing is that they have to understand is that anger is normal, it's essential. We are not asking anybody here to give up their anger, if we did so, they would be incredibly threatened. They would not feel, it's their defense mechanism, and it's, it's our defense mechanism too. They wouldn't feel safe. So, you know, we, we emphasize that learning how to manage anger doesn't mean suppressing it, doesn't mean giving it up. Um, we also emphasize that anger almost never occurs by itself. It comes in a complex of other feelings. And so uh, an attitude or an approach that really permeates the entire program is that patients learn how to identify these other feelings and give voice to them. Instead of giving voice to their anger, they identify what else they're feeling and learn how to, how to give voice to these other feelings. So people with TBI go through life basically feeling one down. They've lost power, they're confused, they feel stupid, they feel demeaned, um, and Part of, it, part of um, their recognition of, of these feelings and their developing willingness to tell other people instead of screaming at other people to say, I'm confused, can we go over that again? Or, you know, I, I feel, um, I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad when this and that happens to me. They gain sympathy from other people rather than driving them away. And, and that's part of their learning uh, to increase the repertoire of their responses to threat. It's not easy, <coughs> mind you. Um, the first thing that we did with this program was to do a little pilot study of once we had the manual developed, we had our eight sessions, we had the everything uh, set up, we did a little 
pre and post test design without a control group, just to know if it's feasible, if people like it, if it's understandable, to get an idea of the effect sizes we would have. Um, so we did it with 10 people, of course, most of them were males. They were sort of young, middle age. Uh, this is all very typical of the population. Uh, there were long posts. The median was four years post-TBI. They had chronic anger problems. Um, I, I told you about post-traumatic amnesia. They had a median 51 days spent in this, this uh, confusional state. It's a very severe TBI. The shortest PTA was 11 days. They had severe cognitive deficits. We really wanted to push. They, they couldn't be amnesic from day to day, obviously, but a lot of them had really severe memory problems. Uh, so we, we pushed the, the window on that to see if we could help these people with a s simplified uh, manual. And uh, we did exclude for serious depression, definitely excluded for bipolar disorder, and we continued to do that. Um, the anger measures we used, I've already mentioned, the STAXI, we measure trait anger, that's a general tendency toward anger and hot-headedness. We use this anger expression out, which I've mentioned. And we use this little questionnaire called the Brief Anger Aggression Questionnaire, which Roland Mayuro developed. Uh, and this captures more extreme acting out anger or, or, or passive aggression. So it's not redundant with the other measures. Um, I'm not going to go through the results, but this is our pre-post results, and just want to show uh, higher scores are worse, so uh, people did get better pre to post. That was a good thing. Um, statistically significant, and the, the effect sizes were actually pretty, these are pretty large effect sizes. We were very, quite surprised by this. Now, we also asked the significant others to measure the patients on the same exact measures pre and post. Their trends were similar, but it was the less dramatic, so they, they endorsed change, but not quite as much. There was one that had a large effect size, and that was a good one, the anger expression out. So significant others were essentially saying, these people are, you know, my loved one is not being as irritable with me. Uh, just These are just the individual uh, change things, and I just want to show you one thing that I think is interesting. This yellow line represents sort of the high end of normal, so it's interesting that people, even though many people improve, they don't all get to normal limits. We actually didn't expect them to do that. It's also interesting that some people started in the normal range, but they, to get into the study, they could be abnormal on any of them. They didn't have to be abnormal on all three. This is anger expression out. Again, most people changed. Many people didn't get into normal, but we weren't expecting that. And this is the BAAQ. Most people stayed above normal. It's a nice sensitive measure, but uh, most people did change. And then we debriefed people to, to just to see, you know, if they agreed with these kind of quantitative results. Did they feel like they were better? Um, everybody rated themselves as either a little better or a lot better. The significant others did two, except for one who reported, you know, there was no change. Uh, and uh, you know, most people did endorse that after the about eight weeks of treatment, their anger, they felt that their anger had a little less impact on their daily life. One interesting thing was that we also did a pre-treatment uh, little battery of cognitive tests, memory tests, executive function tests. It's a tiny sample, 10 people, you can't really tell, but we saw absolutely no trend in which people with less cognitive dysfunction did better. I, there was nothing, um, you know, people with severe memory deficits. I was astonished. I was one of the therapists in the pilot study, and I was amazed uh, that some of the people I was working with didn't really remember very well from week to week what we had talked about, and they still benefited from treatment. I don't know what that's about, whether just the practice causes implicit learning, and they didn't, you don't have to remember the details, but uh, it, was, it was quite surprising and encouraging. So... Of course, we're not going to take a pilot study to the bank. We are doing a three center randomized control trial, and we just started enrolling last month. We're doing it in three centers, including U UW and Craig Hospital and Moss as the lead center. So, you know, we're, we're, we're using more people. We're shooting for 99 people. 66 of them will be in the anger self management uh, protocol that we designed. And the other 33 will be in a control treatment that we wrote for this for this trial called Personal Readjustment and Education. It sounds like a, sounds like a Mao Tse Tung thing, but <laughs> it's, it's actually based on the idea that people with TBI and their family members 
really don't know what to expect, and you can help them by giving them structured information about brain injury and its consequences, and so, um, and, and give them an opportunity to ventilate and use their own uh, coping mechanisms without getting a lot of direction. So we actually um, made this therapy structurally equivalent to the ASMT, which means same number of sessions, approximately same length of time, given therapist attention, same kinds of uh, practice assignments, uh, I mean different assignments, but same uh, level of expectation for things that you'll do outside of therapy, same involvement of a significant other, same everything, fully manualized, completely written up in the same exact style as the other manual. Um, and we're doing this so that we can try to see if there's really something specific, obviously, about uh, training people to self-monitor and to problem-solve about their anger or whether it's or whether it's a partly a non-specific effect of getting attention and having somebody listen to you and so on. Uh, very challenging. We're also looking in the new study at the trajectory of treatment effects. Do we need all of these, you know, do we need eight sessions, which, you know, we sort of made that up. There's nothing magical about it. Would four sessions work just as well? So we're measuring kind of halfway. The reason that we're doing this is in the pilot, we, we started to get anecdotal indications that people were improving after about four sessions. The significant other would come in and tell us, you know, things that were going on differently at home. And so we decided to, to test that formally. And we're also doing a follow-up. We couldn't afford to do any follow-up in the pilot study, so we're testing people two months after treatment to see if any positive effects persist. Uh, we're doing a range of outcome measures to, to actually formally test this idea that if you manage your anger better, you will also get along with people better, have a better quality of life, and maybe even get out more. Um, and we're going to be looking at predictors of treatment response in a more formal way than we were able to do in the pilot, you know, really looking at, at whether memory disturbance or severity of anger or severity of TBI and executive or executive functions. I just lost the picture. That's okay. I think that was my last slide anyway. <laughs> or next to last. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, that was my next to last slide. Uh, I thought I had too many slides. Apparently I didn't. Um, and so my last slide says thanks for your attention, and um, I guess we can do questions and discussion now. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to do escape and minimize. Okay. Yes? Yeah, so on your graphs of the outcomes in your smaller study, are the colors significant? Is, that, oh. is it the same subject in the same color? Yes. The question was about the slides where I, I showed individual uh, lines, and yes, the colors each represented an individual. So was the one, there was one subject that actually got worse during that time? Mm -hmm. Was that the, self the report from the significant other two that they got worse, or was it one that the significant other got better? Um, can I go back to the slides, or do I need to keep? I can. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. The. I, this is self-report. So this is somebody who I don't know if this is a significantly worse or not. But the, you're right. There is one. You're very attentive. <laughs> there, there is one individual line that goes in the opposite direction, but let's look at his or her. Okay, so that was the only, it, was, it could have been a fluke, and I actually don't have, uh, I don't have the uh, significant other data with me, so I don't know whether they agreed with that or not. Other questions? Yes? Uh, the question is, do, have I used a waitlist condition? I have not, actually. Yeah. No, um, the question is about the waitlist control. No, the waitlist control was one that we considered using instead of an alternative treatment. And one of the reasons that we didn't use a waitlist was 
that we wanted to include this follow-up. And what happens if you have a lengthy, lengthy-ish follow-up in a waitlist study that's also a long intervention, then people drop off the, the waitlist and you have uh, unequal. But there's also, in, you know, I think waitlist controls are good, really good in some uh, instances, but I think they're better for very brief interventions where people really don't have to wait that long, you know. Uh, otherwise, people will seek alternative treatment, and there's evidence actually that people who are in waitlist control groups uh, don't do as well as people in other kinds of control groups. It's 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 weird. So. so you're that being on a waitlist could make you angry. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, yeah, being on a waitlist could make you angry. Yes. Yeah, uh, the question is, is there evidence of an impaired coupling between frontal and limbic systems such that maybe what you mean is that there's uh, impaired inhibition of uh, uh, limbic. There's, um, there's a lab study done by um, um, Sky McDonald and, and colleagues showing that, I mean, it's, I don't know really of a way to directly measure the effects of the frontal system on the limbic system, but they showed people with TBI and controls uh, kind of like anger-provoking film clips. And the t p patients with TBI and frontal lesions uh, overreacted relative to controls. And I don't remember all the details of it, but there's uh, indications that the, the frontal lesions actually do uh, loosen the inhibition over emotional reactions, although I don't know of a way to directly measure that sort of in the brain. But there's behavioral evidence of that. Yeah? If, if, if we want to refer a patient to this uh, multi trial, mm -hmm. multi center study, can yes. Can oh, yes. Turn around. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see, and I'll say this also for the benefit of, say this for the benefit of people who are on the webcast also. So will you, can you guys tell, us liter tell, tell me literally who they should call and at what number? <laughs> you, Soraya? Yeah. Okay, call Soraya Dickman or email Soraya Dickman. Yeah, D I K M E N at U Dub. At U Dub. Yeah, U U Dub. Dot. Well, Washington. you guys are here. You know what am I talking about? <laughs> yes, definitely refer patients. Uh, uh, all the way in the back. Somebody. <laughs> That's a great question. The question is, is there evidence that this could be uh, more efficacious sooner after the trauma? I don't know, and I, I tend not to, I tend to think no, because soon after the trauma, people are actually changing spontaneously, and sometimes, even though this problem is persistent, sometimes you really can have irritability that goes away. So it's not as though nobody gets over it. And instead of really focusing on it, making it a big deal, it's I, my gut feeling is that it's better to wait until somebody really has experienced this problem. We're taking people who are at least six months post-injury into the trial. I think it's, I think uh, earlier after the injury, it might be better to approach it differently using uh, a more of a low-key approach. This is sort of a two-by-four approach. This is, let's sit down and talk about your anger for eight weeks, you know. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. The question is, is there any, is there a role for a cognitive circuit training that's not directly related to the overt expression of anger, but more, an ex are you thinking more of an exercise model where well, pathways can be facilitated? Yeah, I guess It is logical. We don't know really what the connectivity is, though, that we would want to enhance. But, you know, I don't, I don't anyway. I mean, I don't, I don't know if, uh, I'm not on the basic science end. I try to keep up with it as it applies to frontal systems and emotional regulation and so on. And it's, I don't, 
think, though, that the, we're at the state of the art where we could actually know kind of what networks we'd want to prime or, you know, what inhibitory next networks we'd want to exercise in order to increase inhibition. I think someday, I think we'll get there. I think it'll be great. Someday, though, we'll be plugging different pieces of genes back in, too. Yeah? When you listen to medications uh, that might be useful with anger, you didn't listen to uh, mood stabilizers. You know, yeah. I didn't. Well, because I wasn't doing a real thorough review, but you're absolutely, oh, I'm sorry, the question was about mood stabilizers. Why didn't I mention them? I, I should have, actually. I, I, um, uh, I, it's true. I, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't doing like a thorough review of medications, but you're absolutely right that mood stabilizers can be really helpful with, uh, with, ir with aggression and irritation. I'm, you know, you guys know more about this than I do on the medication side. Yes. Right. Um, the question is, what do you do with a patient who can't get into this kind of approach and you have a limited time to work with them and you're following them for medication management? I wish I had a good answer to that. I mean, I think, um, I think uh, access to services from a, a cl good clinical psychologist who knows something about TBI. I think these, these principles are, they're not, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's, these are principles that are used by good clinical psychologists. So I think trying to get patients in to see good clinical psychologists is, is an option. I wouldn't actually try to adapt this kind of method in, in a brief contact where you really don't have a lot of time with patients. And I, I think that would be very frustrating. You emphasize the secondary consequence of uh, diminishing social support and mm -hmm. other sorts of uh, caregivers. What, has anybody looked at getting caregiver support as, a, as an intervention here to help manage the behavior? Yeah, the question is about caregiver support to help manage the behavior. The, I mean, uh, Joanne Brockway in her study, she's right over there, did do caregiver training and it, it, is, a, it is effective. Um, we include the significant others in this in this um, uh, protocol, but we don't actually train we don't actually train them. But there there have been studies where caregivers are trained. Um, the biggest I think the biggest thing for caregivers to learn is how to is antecedent management. You know, uh, you, you hear a lot in behavior modification and behavior management strategies about managing consequences. Well, for brain injury, it's more effective to manage antecedents. So caregivers can and should learn, you know, what kinds of conditions really set off this problem and avoid those situations. It, it's really not productive actually to talk with somebody about their anger or to get them involved in a discussion when they're angry. Just analyze the situations that make, you know, that cause problems and try to work around them is the best caregiver training. But but they, and they do need support, but actually learning how to manage the situation and reduce the anger is, is, is the best reward for the caregiver. Which may be something that the, the providers and clinics, as you just described, who don't have access to be working with. Yes, that's a good point. Other questions, discussion? Thank you very much. Oh, one more? <laughs> Well, the question is, the same methods or similar methods work in people with and without TBI, and does that suggest that there's, that, really no, lesion that there's no lesion? The anger, yeah. The yeah. Anger in other right. Say it's the same lesion in the too. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, I mean, there may be a continuum of, think about the people you know uh, for a minute, let alone, <laughs> let alone TB, yeah. let alone yeah. TBI. Yeah. Well, um, the thing is that executive functions, which 
include control over anger and other emotions, self-regulation, are the most evolved functions of the brain. And, you know, they're, uh, the primitive functions are, you know, as you, as you just go rostral to caudal, no, I'm sorry, caudal to rostral, you, you get more and more, you get more advanced. You also get more variable in the general population. So if you think, never mind TBI, never mind anger, if you think about the people who you know and how variable they are in their ability to plan ahead, uh, uh, quit, stop, uh, stop shooting themselves in the foot, uh, keep their mouth shut when it's not appropriate to blurt something out. I mean, you don't need a brain injury for these kinds of executive <laughs> deficits. We all have them. At, think about self-awareness, or maybe don't think about self-awareness. I mean, um, self-awareness is impaired in all of us to some extent. So there is kind of a continuum. Um, brain injury doesn't, I mean, TBI doesn't take out a part of the brain that does, it's not a, this is not a module we're talking about that if you knock it out, it causes anger. It's, um, there are systems that work for all of us to, to manage these kinds of things that are highly variable across people and they just get worse after a TBI uh, and they get worse in some characteristic ways. So we're not really trying to fix a lesion. We can't do that anyway. We're looking for you know, a cluster of um, uh, r causes for some of these symptoms that people really can learn how to manage. Uh, I was telling somebody before the talk when um, uh, you know, I had this, we were talking about the topic, I use these techniques on myself and my husband all the time. <laughs> all the time. I've learned a lot from you know, helping other people learn about it. You said there's a universal design quality to some of these self-regulation uh, uh, treatments because we can all benefit from them. Your husband wasn't that purple line going out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hart. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Folks, as you're going out, if you haven't had your flu shot yet, you can go down the hall and get your flu shot. No waiting right now. Get protected. See, so you've, you've heard a great lecture and we'll get a flu shot. <laughs>